I've uh, described uh, the experiment, the Hall effect experiment in the lab, and the way it's uh, been carried out in a, a typical undergraduate lab. Uh, let me uh, now uh, do the calculations of uh, the Hall effect, the classical Hall effect as uh, you know introduced by Edwin Hall in uh, uh, 1879. Just classical Hall effect and uh, it's just based on um, you know moving charges in a magnetic field. Uh, so they uh, face a low range force and uh, let me make this uh, diagram a little clear so that you understand. So this is a thin sample. Uh, I'm showing a bit of thickness just for visual understanding. So we'll uh, plot this, you know, the show the axis as X and this is the Y axis and of course the Z axis is this, okay. It was uh, shown slightly differently just uh, that we uh, show the Hall voltage being collected uh, in an experiment. Uh, so, uh, the y axis is uh, towards uh, the, the direction that is shown, that is the positive y axis, positive x axis is towards uh, right and uh, z axis is upward. And uh, one applies a magnetic field here along the z axis. Um, so, this is the, the experiment uh, and uh, then one actually sends a current density in this direction because it is in this x direction. and uh, because the magnetic field is in the z direction and there is a current flowing in the x direction. So, the Lorentz force which uh, is uh, written as, so let us call it as a FL uh, just to make sure that it is Lorentz. So, it is a Q and a V cross B. Right now, we are not uh, worrying about the sign of Q which we will do that a while later. So, if uh, V that is the electrons are moving along the x direction and the magnetic field is along the z direction. So, this results in a force in the minus y direction, okay. And the minus y is towards this direction. So, there is a Lorentz force acting in this direction and the charges will, you know, uh, get accumulated in this uh, surface of the sample, okay. So, uh, this is and let us say that this is a width that is w. So, the Lorentz force which we already wrote, uh, it is of the form which is more convenient to us. It is a J cross B because uh, a V and uh, or rather I should write it as uh, a vector J not unit vector. So, it is a J cross B. I mean, so J is in the x direction we have said, B is in the z direction. And uh, so, this Lorentz force will act in the minus uh, y direction, okay. So, uh, is the shaded wall in which the charges build up. And uh, so, there will be because of this charges being built up, uh, there will be electric field that will develop which we will call it as uh, E y. Uh, let us call that as E y. So, this is in the of course, in the y direction and uh, if uh, w is the uh, width that is shown there, uh, then that will result in uh, a voltage because of this electric field. Let us call that as a v y which will be E y into w, okay. Uh, so, that is the voltage uh, and this uh, uh, voltage actually would uh, the sign of the voltage rather would uh, uh, tell you about the nature or the properties of the charge carriers that are responsible here, okay. Uh, suppose the uh, case 1, suppose the charges are negative in magnitude which are electrons. Okay. So, uh, the charge is minus Q and in that case uh, one has uh, J x is equal to minus Q and N, N being the density of the carriers and uh, because it is uh, the charges are flowing along the x direction, it is minus Q N V x. So, uh, Q is of course, the magnitude of the charge and uh, N is the a density of carriers.
All right. So, uh, we have uh, when the charges are negative. So, this is say case 1 uh, and uh, then we have uh, <coughs> you know in that case uh, the electric field that will be developed um, will be in the minus y direction okay and um, so the whole voltage because the electric field which is e y is in the negative y direction so whole voltage is uh, negative okay uh, so uh, this gives a negative whole voltage we'll show what are the implications of this now, consider the charges to be positive. Which means they are plus Q. Okay? And uh, if that happens, then uh, the Jx uh, that is there, then that is equal to uh, Q into n into vx and um, uh, so vx is of course flowing in the direction uh, in the positive x direction and uh, let me show you that what happens to the charges in this particular case the first case that we have talked about so these are so this is the edge and all the uh, negative charges will um, you know, so let, let me show it here, all the negative charges will accumulate there, but then because of the charge neutrality of the sample, this will, uh, the positive charges will get accumulated there, okay. Now, what happens is that uh, this cannot go on indefinitely uh, because uh, the Lorentz force will eventually be completely balanced by the force due to the electric field that develops in the y direction. So, uh, these uh, motion of the charges will stop after all the uh, free charges that are there, they get accumulated. Okay? This is the direction of the Lorentz force and these are the accumulation of the charges. Similarly, in this uh, next case, when you have these Jx to be like this, then the electric field will be um, positive uh, is in the plus y direction and if that is in the plus y direction the uh, the whole voltage will be also be positive okay so uh, the whole voltage is uh, nothing but this uh, vy which we have discussed just in the last slide so uh, this vy is uh, positive uh, and in that case what happens is the same picture if we go to and show them there in a similar geometry. So, you, one has a positive charges that are accumulated there and the negative charges will accumulate there again for the charge neutrality of the sample. Okay. So, this is uh, what happens uh, when you have positive and negative charges. In metals, mostly one finds that uh, there are electrons. So, the charge carriers are negatively charged and one get the uh, whole voltage to be negative. Okay. So, Vy to be negative. So, now uh, what are the uh, quantities? Let us do a little calculation on the quantities that we actually measure. Okay. And the quantities that we measure, which has been told earlier, is called as a Hall coefficient. And the Hall coefficient is defined as Rh divided by Ey, which we have defined, then Jx, we have defined that as well, multiplied by the B. And this B is uh, the magnetic field that is a constant magnetic field that is applied in the z direction perpendicular to the plane of the sample. Okay? And the charges are uh, mainly concentrated in the two dimensional plane. All right. 
So, uh, before we uh, talk about the Hall effect, I mean, uh, let us talk about the magneto resistance. That is the resistance uh, that the sample or the system develops because of the presence of uh, a magnetic field. So, the magneto resistance, which is a longitude, is also called a longitudinal resistance. In fact, for most of our discussion, we will call this as a longitudinal resistance. And uh, this uh, as a function of H, uh, it is uh, uh, E x versus uh, J x. E x is the electric field that is developed along the x direction uh, and J x is the corresponding current that is flowing in the sample. Uh, now, this of course, uh, is not a function of uh, B. Uh, let us write it as uh, uh, instead of writing it as H, let us write it as B. However, it is not a function of B. Okay. It, it is independent of B. So, it really does not matter uh, that what uh, B one applies uh, and eventually when the equilibrium is established, then the Lorentz force gets balanced by this uh, uh, transverse uh, electric field and that is why there is no dependence on the, uh, the magnitude of uh, the magnetic field here. Okay. And, um, so, how do we write down the equation of motion for this uh, case where uh, there is a, a current flowing in the x direction and then the magnetic field in the z direction? Uh, we have to write down the classical equation of motion which is nothing but uh, it is uh, there in electrodynamics excepting that now I am writing for the charge I am writing it for the electrons uh, and this is E and it is a P it is actually a V cross B, but V can be written as uh, P over M, P is the momentum uh, and then cross B. Now, uh, this is not all and this is of course, uh, uh, you would write it down just a charged particle which is uh, moving uh, in free vacuum. Uh, but however, in a material where you are doing the experiment, there has to be another term which gives rise to resistivity. Uh, see, free electrons are good description of Fermi systems. Okay? However, they do not yield resistivity unless you consider uh, the Drude picture that uh, the electrons are otherwise free. There are a lot of free electrons present. The electrons actually drift uh, in the sample freely unless they collide with each other and the collisions will give rise to the resistivity. Okay? So, this origin of the resistivity was uh, told by Drude and he uh, gave a few uh, you know hypothesis which sort of strengthened his ideas of how one can get a resistive uh, behavior of the metal because everything is resistive finally. Um, the, and the power dissipated uh, in a circuit is given by I square R uh, or uh, you know V square by R. So, there is a resistance there. And the resistance uh, in Drude's picture that comes from the, the uh, collisions, um, uh, either they are frequent collisions or they are infrequent collisions depending on the uh, size of the sample that you are talking about. But there are collisions and these collisions would um, instantaneously change the velocity uh, of the particle after the collision and it, it goes in a completely random direction which tells you the average velocity of the electrons after collision is equal to 0 and the, uh, the time uh, that elapses between two such collision is known as the relaxation time. Okay? So, if you read uh, Drude's theory of metals, uh, you will get all this description. So, uh, till the collision occurs, the electron drifts as free particle. The collision occurs the velocity of the electron, say you talk just concentrating on one electron, uh, the electron goes in a direction which is completely random and cannot be predicted. And um, Drude also had brought up this uh, notion of temperature and he said that uh, the hotter regions of the sample uh, would have more uh, energetic electrons emerging out after collisions. So, uh, that uh, information is also there uh, because you have learnt in your school level that the resistance actually increases as you increase the temperature either linearly or uh, otherwise. I mean, mostly we have studied uh, linear uh, behavior uh, with, with temperature. So, this is not enough. We have to have a term which is like minus P over tau, 
where uh, of course p is the momentum and tau is called as a relaxation time. So, what is relaxation time? The relaxation time is the time between two successive collisions. So, the electrons would collide and then they would drift like a free particle till that electron finds another electron or impurity or uh, defect or disorder to scatter with between these two events, two collision events, uh, it drifts like a free particle and the time corresponding time is called as a relaxation time. So, this is the equation of motion. Okay? Now, uh, the equation of motion will have to be, uh, you know, at equilibrium, there will be no force on the particle. That is, uh, this is exactly what we have said, that once the equilibrium is established, the low range force exactly balances the force due to the electric field that develops in the y direction. So, once that happens, there will be no net field and the dp dt will go to 0, because dp dt according to Newton's second law is the force. So, if that is equal to 0, we can write down uh, for the x and y components. So, for x and y components, okay, one can write down a 0 equal to minus E, e x minus E b by m uh, this is P y. I am writing now uh, this equation, the equation that you have seen here uh, in terms of components, uh, you have E having both E x and E y. Uh, the momentum of the particle has both components P x and P y. Once again, I remind you that this electronic motion is confined in a plane. So, P is not, uh, the vector P is not P x, P y, P z. Let me write it here that this is equal to E x and E y. E x is in the direction of the, the current, the motion of the current and uh, the P x uh, of course, will have to be P x and P y and uh, you uh, already know that B is in the, it is a constant field in the z direction and so on. Okay, All right. So, uh, this is uh, equating the x and y component, this is about the x and uh, this is about the y. So, I write dpx dt for 1 and then the dpy dt and then individually putting them equal to 0. So, this is e y, uh, okay, sorry, there is a term that I missed here. So, it is a px over tau, the relaxation time and then there is a, a eb over m px. Uh, and a p y over tau. Uh, if you read some books which uh, do not use s i notation, uh, you will find a c in the denominator here. Okay? We do not write that, so we are writing in uh, s i unit, so that, that c will not be there. And um, if you now define a quantity called as omega b, uh, it is equal to e b over m. Okay. Now, this I write it as omega b, but a lot of uh, texts uh, actually uh, write it as omega c because it is called as a cyclotron frequency. And if you remember what cyclotron frequency is, in presence of a magnetic field, the charged particle actually will undergo a rotational motion. Okay. And uh, this rotational motion will uh, correspond to an angular frequency and this uh, cyclotron frequency is exactly the angular frequency that one is talking about. So, the frequency will increase linearly with B. So, as you increase the magnitude of uh, omega B will increase which means the cyclotron frequency increases. All right. So, uh, once uh, you get this, what happens is that we can write down, uh, you know, simplify this equation and um, we can write down these equations as E e uh, x equal to minus omega b uh, p y. Uh, so, let us call that as equation 1 and 2. So, equation 1 and 2 become omega b p y minus uh, p x over tau the for the y component that is from 2 
this is equal to uh, minus omega b p x uh, minus p y by tau. Okay? So, this looks like a kind of coupled equation where E x depends on both P y and P x and E y also uh, depends on uh, both P x and P y. Okay? Now, physical consideration of the system would definitely yield that uh, in the steady state, uh, the P y cannot go on indefinitely. That is the P y will have to go to 0 because this is the y direction. Let me go back to that original figure. and. Uh, Okay, so this is the uh, figure. So your p y, which is the uh, momentum in this direction, uh, will have to stop once the equilibrium is established because the charges cannot go out of the sample. Okay, and uh, it, it's also in this direction uh, the charges. Like either you know positive charges will accumulate at the front uh, shaded region and the negative or the at the back, the other opposite end or the vice versa, uh, but in any case the P y will have to go to 0 uh, in at equilibrium. So, uh, at equilibrium P y is equal to 0. So, uh, if you put that then uh, what you get is that, so P x is equal to minus E e x tau. Okay? Uh, this p x that comes uh, from the first equation. So, let us call it a 3 equation number 3 and then equation number 4. So, this is like a from 3. Um, you get this. So, as a result you get uh, j which is nothing but n e into p by m because it is n e v and uh, that is how the current density is defined in terms of the electronic motion that is the velocity of the electrons. Uh, so, this is equal to uh, uh, minus n e v x and this is equal to minus n e p x over m and uh, if you uh, substitute that then it becomes minus n e and uh, p x is nothing but minus e e x tau. This capital E is the electric field, the component of the electric field and so on. Okay? So, this gives you j x equal to n e square uh, tau by m and uh, e x. Okay? So, this is the j x and this is a comforting equation and the reason is that, that this is exactly nothing but uh, it comes from Drude's theory or it is a restatement of Ohm's law which tells you that j which is the current density can be written as sigma into e. Okay? and uh, where sigma is uh, the conductivity and conductivity is actually a tensor. In our case, it is a 2 by 2 matrix as a tensor of rank 2. So, here the j is in the direction of uh, the electric field. So, j x in the direction of E x and so on and this uh, sigma is called as the is n e square tau by m. It is a known formula for uh, conductivity of metals. So, uh, the conductivity that is sigma uh, depends on n, it depends on the charge, uh, the square of the charge rather, the uh, relaxation time tau and m. Okay? So, um, this looks fine and um, if we um, go uh, one step ahead and try to calculate rho uh, which we have said. So, let us uh, write, so the magneto resistance. which is nothing but rho because it is in presence of B, I am writing it, but of course, there will be no uh, B that is there. So, rho is equal to E x by J x. Okay? Now, this makes sense because rho is inverse of sigma here, rho is called as a resistivity. Okay? So, that is uh, the resistivity that we are talking about and that is equal to m by n e square tau. And uh, so, this is of course, uh, independent of, uh, so rho is rho of B is uh, uh, inverse of sigma and it is given by m by n e square tau. Okay? And uh, this is also a known result uh, and this is the 
magneto resistance that is uh, resistance uh, in presence of the magnetic field though you do not see the magnetic field for the reason that I told you that uh, at equilibrium all these uh, properties are being calculated and uh, no matter what the value of the magnetic field is uh, the resistivity in the direction of the current will always be this or so to say that this is the same as DC resistivity or uh, resistivity when B equal to 0 let us not talk about uh, DC. So, this is also the resistivity uh, for B equal to 0. Okay. And um, this is uh, of course, as I said, it is independent of B. Now, let me show you the second uh, equation which we have not uh, used uh, much or fourth equation rather. Uh, let us see what that gives. So, from uh, 4 what one gets is that the E y is equal to omega b over uh, E uh, into P x equal to minus omega b uh, tau uh, E x. Uh, so, that is your um, uh, e y. So, that gives you E y equal to this. So, the Hall coefficient which we have uh, defined earlier, the Hall coefficient is defined as R h. I am redefining it here. It is equal to E y divided by j x into b, the magnetic field. And this is nothing but um, omega b by E into p x and divided by minus n e uh, p x divided by m into b. And if you simplify this, this comes out to be, so uh, you have uh, omega uh, b uh, p x uh, m uh, and uh, with a minus sign, uh, let us put a minus sign here and uh, you have a n e square the p x will cancel uh, and it is n e square and a b. Okay? So, that is the Hall coefficient. So, uh, in the Hall coefficient if we use uh, omega b which is what we have uh, that is the cyclotron frequency which is equal to e b over m uh, then your r h becomes equal to a minus e b over m into um, m and then uh, you have uh, there is a m here uh, m m is was in the denominator so the m will be there so there is this and then you have a n e square b and this is equal to nothing but a minus 1 over n e which is a result that is usually obtained in the lab so, I, I, can, I can write this as the magnitude is equal to 1 over any and uh, this tells you that the Hall uh, resistance or the uh, Hall coefficient rather here the Hall coefficient is a constant and it does not depend upon B and the reason is same because we are talking about the, the at equilibrium uh, the effect of magnetic field uh, does not come. Okay? So, uh, this is uh, pretty much what one learns in the uh, classical Hall effect. Uh, why we are doing it is the following that uh, we will be introducing quantum Hall effect and uh, at several places we will have to you know fall back on the classical version of the Hall effect and show that how this is different. In fact, this is one of the main differences of the Hall resistivity which uh, here it is uh, constant that is it does not depend upon B. Uh, but there of course, as B changes the uh, Hall resistivity uh, the, or the resistance that changes. Okay? So, uh, here uh, it is independent of that. Okay. And uh, of course, uh, it is also independent of the relaxation time. So, it really uh, that tau was hanging around uh, at various places, uh, but it does not make an entry into the Hall coefficient, uh, the expression for the Hall coefficient, which means that uh, it really does not uh, matter what tau x is. Uh, so, what is tau x physically is that as I told that it is uh, um, the time that elapses between two successive collisions. So, now the tau is large if the collisions are too infrequent that is uh, the collisions rarely occur 
then tau is large and uh, in a heavily disordered sample tau will be small and the electron will undergo a collision with uh, a, with another electron or defect or impurity etc too often okay but here this result doesn't depend upon on the tau okay so uh, just to give you order of magnitude for uh, rh or the values of rh for typical metals Uh, you will be told uh, in your undergraduate course that it uh, finds out the uh, the carrier density and the sign of the carriers for semiconductors, but it does not matter you can do the experiment uh, on metals as well and uh, the result will be clear because uh, uh, the, the mainly the charge carriers are the electrons that is what emerges out. So, let me uh, show some this is the element and what you get is you get a, a 1 over Rh into Ne. Okay. So, that tells you because Rh is equal to 1 over Ne, then 1 over Rh is Ne and the Ne that is there. So, what you do is that you find this uh, uh, quantity and this quantity should be equal to 1. So, this is should be 1 ok that is the Drude value rather ok. But uh, because of uh, a number of reasons actually in experiments it deviates slightly from 1 and that is what we want to show. It can depend upon the temperature of the sample. So, if you are not at very low temperature then it can deviate or if you are not at uh, you know if you are at too low, low value of uh, B it can deviate as well, but as you uh, you know go to lower temperature and larger magnetic field it gets closer to that. So, for example, lithium it has a value 0.8 uh, then uh, you know sodium it has a value 1.2 which is symmetrically placed. Uh, then uh, we have potassium, it is 1.1 and so on. So, a cesium, it is a value exactly, it is 0 0.9 and so on. So, these are the uh, alkali metals and uh, then you have a copper, which is uh, known to be a good metal, it is 1.5. Then silver, which is known as the best metal, that is known. Uh, so, this is 1.3. Uh, gold is uh, for example, it is 1.5 again and uh, uh, let me uh, give you uh, some examples. So, these are good metals. Okay. Maybe aluminum also, but uh, so uh, and there are uh, these B, E, M, G, etcetera, aluminum, aluminum comes here. Uh, it has a value B has a value minus 0.2. So, it deviates quite a bit. Uh, the magnesium is minus 0.4 and uh, this aluminum is minus 0 0.4, 0 0.3 or 0.4. So, uh, these are uh, the values. This uh, of course, the sign is negative and um, the current is uh, carried by, by charges which have positive signs. Okay. So, this is what we have uh, seen. Uh, so, these are called as holes as opposed to the electrons which is what we have seen. Okay. So, with this introduction uh, or rather this uh, description of the classical Hall effect, let us uh, try to uh, go towards the quantum Hall effect. This discussion will be uh, very thorough and uh, uh, quite elaborate. Uh, so, right now just where we are uh, and then we want to uh, you know understand that what happens in a quantum Hall effect. Uh, let me uh, sort of write down the same Drude equation or the Ohm's law. This is also called as Ohm's law. It is J equal to sigma is nothing but V equal to I R, right? Because uh, you can multiply J by the area uh, which will give you I, and then uh, this E will be equal to V and so on and then sigma is an inverse of the resistance and so on. So, this is uh, nothing but the Ohm's law. So, if you consider that you have a J 
that is only confined in the x y plane then and this sigma is is actually the called as the conductivity tensor and sometimes we will write uh, with a double arrow double header arrow there but even if we do not uh, always understand that this is tensor. So, this is uh, a conductivity tensor. All right. So, uh, once uh, you know uh, these things um, are clear, so J has uh, two components which are like Jx and Jy. Okay. So, if we write this, so our sigma will be like sigma xx, sigma xy, sigma yx. Uh, we have to be a little careful, the sigma xy and sigma yx may not be same. And in this particular case, it is definitely not same. Uh, in fact, they differ by a sign and I uh, will give you a proof uh, that y uh, in uh, two dimensional electrons when it is subjected to a transverse magnetic field or a perpendicular magnetic field, y necessarily the conductivity tensor or the resistivity tensor has to be antisymmetric which means the sigma x y is equal to minus sigma uh, y x. Okay? And this is very typical property of electrons. Uh, in a magnetic field. So, this is equal to uh, E x and E y. So, this if we actually go to this uh, equations that we have seen here, uh, these equations, these 1, 2, 3, 4, etcetera, then we it is not difficult to write down that this sigma uh, tensor is nothing but it is n e square tau over m and divided by 1 plus omega b square tau square 1 and minus omega b tau and uh, omega b tau and equal to 1. You see I said that they differ the off diagonal elements differ by a sign which is what is coming here as well. Uh, take it as a small exercise and try to work out the relationship between the components of Jx, Jy and Ex and Ey. Okay? Uh, so, uh, they are connected by this relation. So, when you write Jx and Jy and you put this sigma that I have written here in this uh, slot and uh, then they would smoothly connect with the Ex and Ey that you have seen. Now, I told you that uh, this sigma 0 uh, let us call this as sigma 0, you can call it as sigma drude also. This is the drude result. This is n e square tau by m. Okay? So, this is equal to sigma 0 divided by 1 by omega b square tau square and uh, 1 minus omega b tau and uh, so on. Okay? Uh, omega b tau and omega b tau and 1. Okay. Now, what happens is that if you have a very clean system, now we are farther, you know, uh, making uh, assumptions uh, which will lead to some very interesting results. Uh, these assumptions are needed. Uh, if you make um, the uh, system to be clean, so consider a clean system. And what do you mean by clean system? The clean system means there are no impurities or defects or disorder in the problem. In which case your uh, tau will become uh, very large. Okay? Uh, this we have told earlier as well that uh, uh, the relaxation time in the event there are very infrequent collisions or almost no collisions tau becomes very large and when tau becomes very large this quantity will become uh, equal to uh, you know your from here what one gets is that the sigma xx is equal to uh, sigma 0 divided by 1 plus omega b square tau square right because uh, this element is 1 and that will get multiplied with what is there outside the uh, matrix. So, uh, this sigma 0 uh, divided by 1 plus omega b square tau square as uh, same as omega y uh, sigma y y, 
but then let's not talk about sigma y y because you are sending current in the uh, x direction okay uh, the sigma uh, y y is there this element is there but uh, this element is we are not sending a current uh, in that direction when we'll be doing that then this thing will make sense but then this also exists okay now if tau is very large your sigma xx will go to zero okay now there's something very interesting happens so sigma xx will go to zero because the tau becomes very large and you can neglect one in front of uh, this uh, second term so when you can do that and you have an infinity in the denominator then of course sigma xx goes to zero okay and um, that tells you that no longitudinal current flows in the flows i mean basically there is no longitudinal current because the conductivity has uh, vanished if the system is clean okay but otherwise of course this is just a, a sort of assumption that you are taking a clean system where a tau is made to vanish a tau is made to be very large in which case sigma xx uh, vanishes okay all right but in general uh, sigma xx will be uh, non zero in a realistic case where uh, the tau is not infinitely large it could be large but not infinitely large so that it exists and in that case if we want the resistivity tensor okay which is written by rho um, and uh, you have to be careful because if you need to get this you need to invert this and uh, this is not an inversion that is 1 by sigma xx or something it's uh, sigma is a 2 by 2 matrix which is what we have said you have to calculate y by taking so this will be like sigma y y divided by the determinant of sigma and then this will be like sigma uh, yx and so on and then determinant so it's basically the cofactor divided by the determinant and so on so this is like sigma xy i think there will be a sign somewhere uh, and and so on so forth okay so uh, this is sigma xx by determinant of sigma so this will give you the rho matrix uh, or the resistivity tensor uh, uh, which is what we have called it so the relationship between the sigma xx so it's a 2 by 2 problem which you can easily you know invert it by uh, taking the cofactor and dividing it by the determinant and uh, in that case the relationship between xx and uh, the rho x sigma xx and the rho xx are like this so this is the uh, denominator that i have been talking about yeah the denominator which is determinant of sigma so this this is that okay this, so this is sigma xx and the sigma xy these two are important uh, because the other two will follow uh, automatically when we there is a sign change that ha occurs here and uh, that is uh, that should be taken into account so this is equal to minus rho xy uh, divided by the same denominator uh, which is coming from the determinant of the sigma matrix so this is rho xy square so this is the relationship between the the sigma xx and rho xx now you see that if you do not have a rho xy then of course sigma xx is 1 by rho xx so that then if you do not have uh, the off diagonal elements then you can always write uh, the elements to be just simply uh, you take the inverse of the elements and then uh, you'll be fine but now we have very importantly the this um, of diagonal elements which actually talk about the hall resistivity because you send current this rho xy or sigma xy are related to the hall resistivity you send current in the x direction and you measure the conductivity or the resistivity in the y direction so that is what is most important for us so that cannot be neglected okay so uh, if we have this uh, let us uh, you know um, discuss the following scenarios
So number one, if if rho x y equal to zero, which is what I said, then sigma x x equal to one by rho x x, which you can see from the uh, the equation this one. Let's call it uh, this as we have been calling equations. So now let's call it as one and two. Okay, which are not same as the one and two that we have discussed earlier. All right, and of course your sigma x y equal to zero because sigma x y is uh, rho x y in the numerator, and because rho x y equal to zero, then uh, sigma x y equal to, to zero as well. And this is a familiar thing. Okay, so this is a familiar scenario. All right. So, uh, what's the second scenario? The second scenario is that if uh, the rho x y is not equal to 0, now this interesting, if the rho x y is not equal to 0, then uh, sigma x x and sigma x y both exist. Okay because uh, x y is not equal to 0. So, you have both of them uh, to be existing. Now, as a special case consider that rho x x equal to 0, which tells you that sigma x x is also equal to 0, because rho x x uh, is in the numerator of the sigma x x. That will happen if the denominator completely does not vanish. That means, provided rho x y is not equal to 0. You see that is coming from 1 here. You have assumed that rho x x equal to 0 that will make the, uh, the sigma x x equal to 0, but the sigma x x can only become equal to 0 if it is not a 0 by 0 problem. 0 by 0 is uh, it cannot be defined. So, we will have to at least assume that uh, it is the rho x y is not equal to 0 and this is the crux of the problem because rho x y we do not want to vanish for the reason that that is the main you know measurable quantity for us. And uh, this is uh, truly interesting for the reason that what does this mean? This means that it is a absolutely a sort of a conduction without any resistance and that tells you that this is a the conductivity is completely equal to 0. So, it is completely insulating. So, whether it is a perfect conductor or a perfect insulator. This one condition tells you it is a perfect conductor because no longitudinal resistivity and this tells you that it is a perfect insulator because there is no longitudinal conductivity. Okay. Can that happen? Is it a wrong result? It is not a wrong result. It is a correct result and it can happen in presence of a magnetic field and uh, two dimensions is also important here. Okay. And then we will have to sort of take it from here and uh, we will just pose this problem for now and uh, then we will come back to this uh, scenario where you have, I mean if that is the reason then what will happen is that you know this uh, uh, your E x and E y, okay, that is the components of the electric field, this is equal to rho j. So, j x and j y, but what happens is that because of the rho taking this form, one has that E x and E y where rho x x is equal to 0. So, it is 0 rho x y minus rho x y and 0 and then, okay. so j x and j y. Now, you see what happens is the following. You have E x, this is equal to rho x y j y and E y equal to minus rho x y j x, right. If you just do the multiplication, which tells you that E and j are perpendicular because E x is proportional to j y or it is in the direction of j y and E y is in the direction of J x, which means that uh, they are rotated with respect to each other. So, the, the electric field components uh, are x component is in the y direction, which is just a uh, rotation by 90 degree uh, and uh, the other is uh, the E y is in the direction of minus J x, 
which is again a rotation by 90 degree. So, that tells you that uh, this is equal to 0, uh, this is equal to 0 and if that happens that uh, this if you remember that a j dot e is actually the uh, work done that accelerates the charges. And because E and J are mutually perpendicular, uh, this work done is equal to 0. So, this tells you that there is a very strange thing that is happening where the, uh, the transport is completely dissipation less. Okay. And this, there is no work that is required in order to you know accelerate the charges. So, it just happens or it flows on its own. So, there is no work done that is required. Okay. So, this is that is why there is no dissipation and uh, this uh, all these things will be explained uh, why it happens and why such uh, uh, strange uh, sort of properties that uh, these uh, electrons uh, in presence of a magnetic field uh, it has. Okay. Uh, I will uh, show you just some uh, these are some these pictures of uh, Klitzing. Uh, who discovered in 1980 the quantum Hall effect. So, we are slowly coming to quantum Hall effect after those initial discussions and you see that this is very interesting that the notes written by Klitzing on uh, he said 4 uh, slash 5 which means it is in the night of uh, 4th and 5th February in 1980 and uh, he uh, writes that he found something which is uh, extremely you know fundamental and uh, then he, he keeps on you know writing the these are these uh, epsilon 0 by mu 0 or mu 0 by epsilon 0. So, this is having a dimension of resistance and there is a dimension of conductance. So, he fixes by the plateaus that you have he fixes the uh, values of this resistance. So, this is called as metrology which I have mentioned that uh, very precisely one is able to calculate the benchmark of resistance from the plateaus of the Hall conductivity. I will just introduce the plots and we will uh, talk about uh, them in the future as well uh, several times. You see the, uh, the red plot that you see here is the Hall uh, resistivity okay? and uh, the green plot that you see is the uh, the longitudinal resistivity which is the magneto resistivity you see the hall actually shows a plateau so this is a plateau corresponding to nu equal to 1 there's a plateau corresponding to nu equal to 2 and nu equal to 3 4 and so on and you would also see that when you are here you actually get a, a, a the straight line for the red curve okay or even you know very close to b equal to uh, 0 that is magnetic field to be very small you get that linear regime and that regime is the classical Hall effect. Here you see that the magnetic field has gone up to 15 Tesla, 15 Tesla is a very large magnetic field okay? and these uh, the Hall plateaus are quantized in unit of h over e square which means this value is h over 1 e square. So, this is h over just e square this is h over 2 e square, this is h over 3 e square and h over 4 e square and so on and so forth. Okay? So, these are the plateaus and you also see that it is exactly what we were talking about uh, on the last slide that you see that uh, this green one which is a longitudinal resistivity which is rho xx okay? and this is equal to 0, it remains 0 all the time this green thing excepting when there is a jump from one plateau to another, it shows a spike. You see everywhere there is a plateau uh, in the red curve is accompanied with a jump in the resistivity of the green curve. Okay? And uh, these of course, these things will have to be understood over time, but at least the zeros of uh, the magnitude resistance that you can see here that tells you the zero and the jump it tells you that 
the system actually undergoes through a large number of uh, you know phase transitions from uh, metal perfect metal because when it is uh, the longitudinal uh, resistivity is zero then it's a perfect metal and then when it jumps it becomes a perfect insulator again it's zero again it's it jumps and so on so forth so the system undergoes through a series of metal to insulator transition this has not been seen anywhere and only happens for these uh, electrons the free charges in uh, presence of a magnetic field we'll uh, talk about that uh, the last uh, slide that uh, we show here is that later on uh, there are three uh, people uh, Laughlin uh, Stormer and Sui they have shown that these uh, resistivity do not occur only at this uh, integer values of this h over n e square where n is an integer n can also be fractions okay so uh, the integer quantum hall effect got a nobel prize cleansing and this also got a nobel prize where one has uh, found out that there are several fractions you see that there's a 2 by 5 3 by 7 probably close to 100 fractions have been uh, discovered however the physics of the integer quantum hall effect when n is an integer and when n is not an integer and is a fraction uh, the physics is uh, very different uh, so this is called as fractional quantum hall effect and the one that you saw here uh, is called as the integer quantum hall effect uh, we'll mostly talk about integer quantum hall effect but also we'll touch upon the fractional quantum hall effect Thank mm -hmm. you.